you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The part of God's Word we'll consider together this morning is our Gospel lesson for today. It's taken from the Gospel according to St. Mark, the third chapter, beginning with verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house and began a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. The teachers of the law, looking down to Jerusalem, said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end is come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth. All the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, He has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, she asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is God's will. Dear Christian friends, how do you define your family? Over the years, we had had a variety of people uh, that were included in family that weren't related by blood, weren't related by marriage, they were related by choice. There's a friend of mine and a friend of Barb's we refer to as Uncle Bill and Aunt Katie. As far as we know, they're not even remotely related to us. But the kids, as they grew up, just referred to them as that because they were kind of adopted into our family. If you ask us how many children we have, we will probably stop to think about how many children we have now because there are many of our children's friends who have been adopted into our family. They come, they go, but while they're there, they're home. And if you think about who you want in your family. You know, there may be some people that you just soon know and found out was related to you. And there may be some people that you wish were related to you, but weren't. But they're still closer than many members of your family. We're going to be looking at some misconceptions about God's family. About the kingdom of Satan. In fact, we're going to, in these verses, we're going to look, through it, look at seven different misconceptions about how God's family and how the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of Satan work. Oh, and I don't have my clicker. I'll be right back. In the first verse, it says that Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. And when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him because they said he's out of his mind. One of the things that scripture is very clear on is that in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, in fact, even up to this point, Jesus' family did not believe. Uh, they thought about it, they heard about it, but they didn't believe. In fact, when they saw and heard about the things that Jesus was doing, look at the evaluation they made of the king of the universe. He's out of his mind. We have to go take charge of him because there's something not right 
with him. And if you think about the expectations that, that people have of Jesus, very many, uh, very often those expectations are unrealistic and, and uh, downright wrong. Uh, did you know that most people believe that Jesus teaches exactly what we want him to? That, there are, that most people have the misconception that if somebody teaches something they don't like, something they disagree with, Jesus couldn't possibly have said it. And if we stand everywhere where Jesus does, people will tell us we're out of our mind. Because Jesus teaches us positive things. That he came and died for everyone. And there is a very common misconception that there are some people for whom Jesus did not die. There are some people who are just too wrong, too evil, too awful, that Jesus could not possibly love them, but he died. There are other things that Jesus teaches that are unpopular. He teaches us what sin really is. Not just what people think sin is. Not just what people are comfortable in how they, how, how they define sin. But how we really, what sin really is. That it is a sin to watch many of the movies that are out. Not because watching movies is sinful, but because the things that are contained in it are sinful. The language that dishonors God is sinful, regardless of how many people you know that use it. Breaking the Sixth Commandment, adultery, is sinful. Whether you're engaging in it, whether you're uh, approving of it, or whether you're teaching people to watch it by what you watch on television. It's a sin. Homosexuality is a sin. Regardless of how many good and wonderful people that you know that don't believe you. And if we stand everywhere that God stands, people have the same opinion of us. In fact, if you are too fervent in your faith, people will try to fix you. If you say, I can't possibly go out tonight, there's church tomorrow morning, People will think there's something wrong with you. If you say, I'll have to call you back, we're having devotion. If you say, can we pray about this? If you say, you know, the Bible says, if you say enough of that, often enough, and you're not a pastor, people will eventually make the same evaluation of you that they made of Jesus. A very common misconception is that a Christian is not significantly different from everybody else. When in fact, Scripture teaches that we really are. Our priorities are an entirely different place. Our priorities are with God and His kingdom. The way that we treat each other is entirely different. We forgive, we accept regardless of where someone has been and what they have done. And we call sin, sin. The next misconception. The teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said he's possessed by Beelzebub. The world's opinion of Jesus. Did you know that there are many people who think that if we removed Christianity, there would be no more war, there would be no more hatred, there would be no more people who would exclude people? That they will actually blame the Christian church for starting wars. Now, I understand where they get that, because many people who call themselves Christian will use God as an excuse for all kinds of hatred and ignorance and sometimes downright war. But the world considers Jesus dangerous. Though many people consider Christianity undesirable for the same reasons that the Pharisees did. The same reasons that the teachers of the law did. Because what Jesus teaches removes their authority. Because what Jesus teaches is against what their sinful nature wants. Our allegiance 
has to be to God and to God alone. Any other allegiance, any other authority derives its power and its respect from our authority to God. So those in power cannot simply change the rules the way that they want to. They cannot simply say, well, now I guess homosexuality is okay because we said so. The world's opinion of Jesus is that he is dangerous. It is a very common misconception. The world's opinion of Christians is that we are crazy or at least a little unstable. I would often wonder when that changed. A generation or two ago, if you did not believe that, that in Jesus Christ, if you were not a Christian, they questioned your honesty. Today, in many parts of our own country, they will question your honesty if you are a Christian. The world's opinion of Jesus is not positive, and it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to change it. So Jesus spoke, came, called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? The kingdom is divided against itself. That kingdom cannot stand. The third of our seven misconceptions today is that Satan is real. There are very, very many people who don't want him to be. There are many, many people who hold on to the misconception that Satan is not real. That the kingdom of hell is not real. That eternal condemnation is not real. When scripture teaches very clearly that Satan is real, his kingdom is active and it is organized and it is effective, and hell awaits anyone without Jesus. Now I have to admit that I have trouble wrapping my head around eternal condemnation. I cannot conceive of winding up there, being there for all eternity, without hope. But that just drives home how important our mission is. And our mission is more than just to show up in church once in a while. In fact, it's more than just to show up in church every Sunday. Our mission is to live our faith. To live it personally. To know that Jesus Christ died for me. Cleaned me up. Made me his own. And to share it. Because God has chosen us to spread the message of life. Because we only have this world to get the message, have the Holy Spirit touch and change our hearts and change our eternity. Because contrary to a very common misconception, hell is real. And it awaits everyone who does not have Jesus Christ. The fourth of our misconceptions it says, in fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. The first word that I want to focus on here is possessions. A very common misconception is that Jesus came to fix a few of my bad habits. That Jesus came to change me so I can be a better person. That I'll still essentially be the same, but as a Christian, I'll be better than I was. When reality is, what Jesus came to do is take us from being entirely enslaved and a possession of Satan, entirely a prisoner in the dungeons of hell, and bring me to life, and grant me freedom that there's, there's nothing I could have done to achieve myself. Who I was, who I was born is a possession of the devil. He owned me. He owned my thoughts. He owned my words. He owned my actions. He owned my present. He owned my future. Until Jesus Christ came and set me free. So when Jesus went to the cross, it was not just a sacrifice to show us about sacrifice. It was to bind up Satan so that he could free us, that he could take us out of his house and bring us to the home 
that we love. A very common misconception is that we're not all that bad, but in fact we are. We are born completely and utterly sinful. And only God can change that. The fifth of our misconceptions is the unforgivable sin. I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. There are many groups that will say, you know what, if you say, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that you are now irredeemable. You cannot be saved. In fact, that's not true. If we look at this in context, if you look at what is happening here, Jesus is preaching, he is teaching, he's working miracles. The problem that the teachers of the law had was that they didn't want him to. Remember what they accused him of? By the prince of demons, he is casting out demons. And Jesus here is warning them about how close they are to the unforgivable sin. The unforgivable sin is willful unbelief. The unforgivable sin is that no matter what God says, I will not believe it. It is hardening your own heart against the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now they were close because they were hardening their hearts against what Jesus was doing. And Jesus says, you can get past that. But if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, if you will take anything that the Holy Spirit says, the message of the Gospel, the message of Scripture, and say at the beginning, no matter what you say, I will not believe it, I reject it utterly, then you are lost. Because the only source of faith is the Bible. And so the unforgivable sin is not a phrase that someone would say. It's not a deed that someone would do. It's a hard heart where they refuse to listen to the gospel. There are people who ask, have I committed the unforgivable sin? And the fact that you would be concerned about it guarantees that you have not because a heart to heart is incapable of being concerned. A heart to heart is incapable of being interested in the things of God at all. The unforgivable sin is rejecting willfully the work of the Holy Spirit. The sixth of the misconceptions is the rights that we have as generational Christians. Uh, Jesus' mother and brothers arrived standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. And then there's the, someone, the crowd was sitting around, and they told them, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. There are people who believe that because their family is Christian, therefore so are they. Now, there were people here, Jesus' family, his mother and his brothers, believed that because they were related to Jesus, he owed them something. That when they called, he had to come. The only way that we are members of God's family is by faith. By the faith that God created in our hearts. Not the faith that He created in the hearts of our parents, or of our brothers and sisters, or of the people that, that we hang around with. It's our own heart. There are people who figure, well, you know what? My parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents were all members of Trinity, so I'm in. The only way in is through faith in Jesus Christ. It matters not who your parents are. It matters not how many people of your family have already gone, to, gone home to heaven. What matters is what's in your heart. And the last of our misconceptions, who are my mother and my brothers? Who is God's family? Only people believe. And you notice how Jesus describes that. He looked at those seated around him, in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now how can you do God's will? In Ephesians, or in Hebrews chapter 11, it says about faith, it's impossible to please God. 
So no one with faith, no one without faith, is able to do God's will. Anyone who does God's will is doing it by faith. Interesting thing about faith is it will find a way to show itself. And it's going to show itself in different ways and different people because God has made us all different. If you read the newsletter article that I wrote in the first page, of course, if you haven't, you have homework. You have to read it now. Maybe next week I'll put a quiz in the bulletin. But if you read that God has made us all differently, now He has made us all to fit together, to work together, to be together, but not to be the same, but to work together with the gifts and the personalities that God has given us. But we will work together. We will find a way to serve. For some of us, we're going to sing in the choir. For some of us, we're going to teach Bible classes. For some of us, we're going to, we're going to reach out to our neighbors and go door to door and invite them to come to church with us. For some of us, well, we'd rather text our friends and remind them to come. For some of us, we'd rather put stuff on Facebook. But we will find a way. We will find a way to honor our God and live our faith. Because God's family is just that diverse. It's just that different. But the way that God designed us is that all of our differences can fit and work together. So, common misconception about God's family is that we're all identical. That God has this shape, this cookie cutter shape of a Christian and then when we come to faith, He stamps that on us. Now that's what we're loving. But God has made us His family, His will, in the way that He has designed us. And without being in the family, we're lost. Because Satan is very real. And hell is very real. And the only way home is through Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. The peace of God that transcends all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.